I was thinking there was another verse. Um, we are in a study of hope during this Christmas season. And uh, we have kind of established a little bit of a groundwork last week. And that we talked about the idea that hope in our culture focuses on possibility. Uh, the lottery system focuses on the idea that maybe I will win. It's slight, but maybe, maybe. And we talked about the fact that in our understanding of hope, in our culture, it's the idea of possibility. But we understood that biblical hope is much different. Biblical hope is focused not on possibility, but on certainty. And so I used the illustration last week of the idea that um, this string, uh, this string represents the world's idea of hope, that I hope this string could lift this cement block. And I didn't know because I had never tried it. And when we tried it, it didn't do it. But biblical hope is more like this. It says, I hope this rope will be able to lift this block. And the reality of it is, it's not a, it's not a problem at all. It's not a problem at all because you know that this rope can hold this block. That's the difference. This is the world's idea of hope. This is the biblical idea of hope. So when we talk about, well, I hope I go to heaven, it's not this kind of hope. It's I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, so my hope is in Christ. So that's the con man. I got to lift weights. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so that's the idea. Okay, that's the that's the concept of it. Um, this morning, what I want us to do is I want us to go back to the creation story, and I want us to understand the first time. God ever offers hope to mankind. Because in that story is packed some principles about hope that we need to understand. So just like last week, we understand that biblical hope is based on certainty, not on possibility. This morning, we're going to see a couple of principles when, that exist in this concept of hope when God comes onto the scene and offers mankind hope. So, before we get into the text, I want you to go back to, in your mind, and I want you to think about creation as it originally existed. God has created a world. He has placed man in, in it. He has created a helper, a someone to come alongside and help Adam in this creation that God has. It is a perfect world at this point. There is no sin. There is Adam and Eve and God and the created world that God has created for man. So let's think about a typical day for Adam and Eve. You get up in the morning, and what do you have in front of you? Well, they had a job. They had to dress the garden and keep it. But that was a job that mainly involves, for the most part, exploration and harvesting. There were no weeds at this point. There was no difficulty. So I'm sure that it was a day unlike uh, that, that the typical day would be just simply going in the garden and saying, hey, we've never tried that. You know, what do you think, Eve? I don't know. What, what do we do with it? How do we cook it? Do we eat it raw? You know, well, it, I don't know. Let's dig it up and let's try it. Potatoes, hey, they're good. Um, tomatoes, these are awesome. Broccoli, eh, we'll leave that for the next group of people. <laughs> you know, I mean, again, their whole day was just spent exploring and enjoying creation. Um, think about it for a second. He comes in and goes, hey, you know that pig that we thought just kept eating and eating and eating? Well, you've got to come over here and see this. There's like eight of them now. It wasn't just hungry. Uh, there was something that happened. Um, you know those eggs that we kept seeing in, in that nest and wondering? You got to come here. You got to check this out. There's now now there's not there's not four of them or five of them anymore. Now there's like three of them and there's two of these little bitty things. You got to check these out. They are really cool looking. That was their day. That was their world. And at the end of the day, God would join them. 
And God would say, well, how was your day? Well, help us understand this pig thing. Or you know what? We tried that broccoli. Oh, you, got, you, need, to, you need to like put a lot of butter on it. Um, you need to season it up really good. No, no, no. It was a perfect world. It was an incredible world. And that's the world that Adam and Eve got to enjoy every single day. It was, the, it was God's original intent. It was the way God wanted it. He wanted to, man to enjoy and appreciate and, and his creation. And they would sit and they would watch a sunset or they would watch a sunrise or they would sleep in and, and get up. And, and, and it was just an incredible world. And one day they're, they're together and Adam and Eve are hanging out. And, you know, I know God said that we couldn't eat of that tree, but let's go check it out. And um, they're hanging around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and Satan comes. And he tempts, he deceives Eve. He says, did God say, what did God really say about this tree? And she says, well, God said we can't touch it. Now, that's not what God said. Um, in fact, God had originally given the instruction to Adam. Adam would have given it to Eve, and I think Adam messed up by adding to it. But Adam and Eve are standing there as Satan deceives Eve. And don't get the idea, some of you are like, you know, well, that woman messed everything up. Whoa, 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 whoa. You need to read your Bible a little more carefully. Because the Bible is very explicit that... Satan took and showed her, hey, look, I ate it. Nothing happened to me. You can eat it too. And it says, and Eve took of the fruit and then gave to her husband, which meant he was right there. And he did eat. And then they both, and then all of a sudden, here's what you need to understand. At that moment, their world changed. At that moment, the whole world changed. Because now, for the first time, sin was now going to be a part of that created world that God had developed. So, with that in mind, let's pick up the, that story and notice what it says. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord. Among the trees of the garden. In other words, everything has now changed. The Bible says that when they ate, they realized they were naked. Until this point, they had not even looked at that as being wrong. They, have, they, they had this openness and this honesty about the way that they lived. Now all of a sudden it's like, oh, I need to cover. I need to, I need to hide something from you. And it falls into the end of the day where they're hiding now from God. They have never hid before, from God before. There was no reason to. But the Lord God called the man, where are you? God didn't do this because he had lost Adam and Eve. God did this so Adam and Eve could realize that they, something had changed. And it says, he answered, he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. The first time fear ever comes into the, into the world that God has created. They are now afraid. Until this point, there was no fear. Now, all of a sudden, they fear. And notice what it says. Because I was naked, so I hid. Now, for the first time, they are now hiding. They're now trying to cover stuff up. They're now trying to put distance between them and God. And he said, who told you you were naked? This has never happened before, Adam. What happened? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Adam, please tell me it isn't so. Notice what it says. And the man said, the woman you gave, you put here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. For the first time now, he starts shifting blame. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Now, parents, let me tell you something. The best thing you can do for your kids is get them to learn very, very early to take responsibility for what they, the choices they make. And this is what's going to happen. What happens here? All of a sudden, Adam looks at him. All of a sudden, now, for the first time, you shift the blame to somebody else. Not my fault. That's never happened before. 
There's never been any reason for that. And, and then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And what did she do? She does the same thing. The serpent deceived me and I ate. By the way, it's interesting. When we end a story, one of the things that you're going to see in the story is that God takes everybody and makes them individually accountable for their choices and their decisions. And that's what you can do as a parent, by the way, those of you who are parenting kids. You can get your kids to understand, okay, fine, yes, he may have done that to you, but this is what you did, and we're now going to deal with what you did. And that's an important thing. Moms, dads, okay, I'm going to get on my little hobby horse, I'm going to ride for a minute, and I'm going to jump off, because I am the husband of a teacher. Some of you are crippling your children Because you let them come home and say, well, the teacher did this, and you never address their behavior. The smartest thing you can do is teach your kids early and often your choice, your consequences. I may deal with something with with, with a teacher or another kid later, but right now we're going to deal with you, and this is what you did. What did you do? And God's eventually going to do that. Right now, he just lets them pass it all the way down the line. And then God's going to come to Adam. He's going to say, okay, Adam, because of your choice, here's what's going to happen to you. If because of your choice, here's what's going to happen to you. He now addresses Satan. And he said, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this. Cursed above you, above all livestock and all wild animals, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. We almost get the idea of that, and I don't, don't get freaked out by this, but there's some people that actually believe like snakes used to be upright. How'd you like to come home and have one standing up, staring you eyeball to eyeball? I know what happens in my house when they're on the ground and my wife finds them, okay? Uh, but he says, you will eat dust all the days of your life. And then he, uh, this is considered in theological circles, depending on how you want to pronounce it, proto-evangelium. Here's what, it's a Latin term. Here's what it means, the first gospel. Here's what it says. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. For the first time, God now offers mankind hope for what he just messed up. Um, Basically, I don't have a lot of time to dive into all of the theological implications of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. But here's what's interesting. Satan has deceived Eve. And the New Testament is clear. He, He deceived Eve, Adam chose. But he deceived Eve in thinking... I'm going to get at God in this perfect world he's created through the woman. Here's what's interesting. When they start passing the buck, God stands up for Adam and Eve. And God, in essence, says this. Satan, you tried to use her against me. I am going to use her to destroy you. And I am now going to bring about, through woman, someone who will crush your head, even though you will bruise his heel. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the Christmas story. And he's talking about this idea that, listen, you try to do it this way, I'm now going to turn the tables on you, and I am now going to use her And through her, you are going to be destroyed. And so God, in essence, gives mankind a glimpse, a picture of what's going to happen at Christmas and ultimately at Easter. And this idea that through Christ, through a woman, Christ is going to come. And Christ is ultimately going to destroy his head. And the head and the heel is the idea of inferior position and a superior position. So this is what you have in the earth. So now what happens is if you follow your Bible story all the way through now after Genesis, the next thing is everything kind of rolls. 
And so you have this constant God preparing mankind for the, the point at which ultimately there is a deliverer, there is a savior who comes. And you watch God continually delivering his people and saving his people and his people turning against him and he continually being faithful to his people until we come to the Christmas story. And so this is what you have. And then I want to fast forward in the past the Christmas story. We're going to deal with the Christmas story as part of hope later. But I want to fast forward to this introduction of hope to show you where it ultimately ends. We call it the triumphal entry. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school, past this event, but this is the event that happens right before that. Here's what it says in Luke. When he, speaking of Jesus, came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. This is at the end of Jesus' 33 years on this earth. This is the last week of Christ. And he says, and, they, and, and blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Where have you heard those words before? That's the Christmas story. And notice what happened. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, teacher, rebuke your disciple. And Jesus said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones are going to start speaking. And as he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. I think as, this, as Jesus looks at this incredible event, all these people sound, here's the bottom line. When you study this thing out historically and biblically and everything else, here's the thing. They wanted a savior from Rome. They weren't interested in religion. They weren't interested in religion, Christianity. They weren't interested in Judaism. All they wanted is, we're under Roman oppression. We think you can beat Rome. You've done all these miracles. You've shown all this power. We now are putting our trust and confidence in you. And Jesus is looking at this going, they just don't get it. And it breaks his heart. And it breaks his heart. And he starts to cry. There are two occasions that Jesus cries, and this is one of them. And it breaks his heart as he's going to the cross and the fact that he knows what he's going to do and he knows why he's going to do it. And he's worked for 2,000 to 3,000 years to come to this event, this fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. And you know what? They don't get it. They're clueless. And he sits there and it just breaks his heart that there's nothing that he can do to make it any clearer to them. And so you have then this idea of even in the Genesis account, God offering them hope. So I think there's a bunch of lessons here that we've got to understand for us. First lesson is this. One of the first things that you learn in the Bible about God is in the worst of circumstances and situations, God offers hope. I mean, look, you're Adam and Eve. You're standing there going, we really messed up. We've just lost everything. Our whole world is turned upside down. We made a really bad choice. You now feel discouraged. You now feel overwhelmed. You feel like you've messed everything up, that all of a sudden now there's no future. There's no hope. God's upset with you. You've wrecked the whole thing. And now all of a sudden you want to throw in the towel and you want to quit. And God comes in and says, you know what? I'm going to make this thing right. Because one of the first things that you see about God is even in the worst of circumstances, God steps in and offers hope. Here's what I would say to you. You may have made some really bad choices. And you may have really messed it up. And your life may be really at the bottom of the bottom of the bottoms right now. Here's what you need to understand. The hope that you need is found in God. I watch people turn to all kinds of things. Well, you know what? You know, okay, so, you know what? I, I, 
maybe, maybe, maybe I can find hope or comfort in a bottle. You, you, you got to realize, that, you know, I know, I mean, when I'm drinking, I feel better. That's this kind of hope, and it's going to fail you. It's going to fail you. Well, you know, okay, so I messed up. Maybe if I just, maybe if I just start dating again, I'll find the right person. That's this kind of hope. Maybe if I get my money thing all figured out, you know, and, and some of you, some of you, when you go through difficult time, you binge eat. That's your way of getting through something. And maybe you know, it'll make me feel better. It'll make me feel better. And, and, and I hope it'll, it, it'll help. It's not going to help you. That's just going to make stuff worse. Some of you go on spending sprees. Um, some of you try all kinds of things that it's this kind, it's this string kind of hope. The kind of hope that you need is going to be found in God. It's this kind of hope. And God steps onto the scene and he looks at Adam and Eve and he says, this is the kind of hope I'm going to give you. Second thing you see about the hope that God offers is this. The hope that God offers always has a future aspect. What God offers them is not going to happen for another couple thousand years. Plus. Plus. You know, we get this idea that when, when, when we're in difficulty, we want this immediate kind of relief, this immediate kind of response. But hope doesn't work like that. Hope has a future aspect to it. In this case, it's going to be thousands of years. Hope is based on things in the future. It's a confidence in some future thing that's going to happen. My hope in Christ. Is not based on something that's going to be immediate. It's not based on something that's going to be a future. Now, I'm going to say something, and when I say it, I want, I, I'm going to say it like four or five times because I want you to hear exactly what I say. I'm going to tell you what my wife tells her kindergarten students. <laughs> Listen to my words. Okay? Don't go anywhere else. You listen to my words. Okay? Are we all there? You're going to listen to my words, okay? And my, by the way, my wife does this with me at home, too, okay? <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I'm not getting something, she'll look at me and say, honey, listen to my words. And I know I'm missing something, okay? So I'm telling you up front, listen to my words, okay? Hope does nothing for your present circumstances. I'm going to say it again. Hope does nothing for your present circumstances. It will not change your present circumstances. Adam and Eve, their world is going to be turned upside down. After this event, God is going to look at Adam and he's going to say, from this point on, your world is turned upside down. You're going to deal with weeds and you're going to deal with problems. You're going to deal with all kinds of stuff. Work is going to be hard now. It's not going to be enjoyable like it was. Woman, apparently, prior to this, childbirth was pleasant and enjoyable and did not involve any pain. Now, it's going to be hard. And it's going to be painful. And it's going to be difficult. And there's, it's going to change the relationship between you and Adam. And then God is going to take both of them and escort them out of the garden and put two flaming swords in front of it and say, you can never go back in there again. Your circumstances have forever changed, and hope is not going to do anything about that. So listen to me very carefully. Hope will not change your present circumstances. Hope will change the focus of your present circumstances. And that's the difference. It's not going to change my situation it will change what I focus on in my situation. That's hope. So let me make a really application of this week. Is, what, is hope going to change the fact that Cheryl has to go forward without Lynn? No. Not at all. There's still going to be all the issues that come with losing a spouse. There's still going to be all, it's not going to do anything for the present circumstances, but it will change the focus 
And what you will learn is this idea that when you focus on, not my present, but the future aspect for me personally, what's my focus been this morning? Or what's my focus been all week with, my, with losing my friend Lynn? I'll see you again. It doesn't make, it doesn't make the day any easier or change the circumstances of the day, but it does change the focus. It does change the focus. That's the hope that I have in Christ. One of my favorite passages, one of the fat passages that I want preached on at my funeral is this. Is second, if there's one passage, if there's one chapter that has gotten me through life more times than any other, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, I, so I could preach on the whole chapter, but we're not going to do that. I've done that before. Um, but I want to focus on the last couple of verses, and I want you to see this. Here's what it says. Therefore, don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, life's tough. Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. In other words, here's what he says. Take everything you're going through and put it on a scale. All the, all the issues, all the struggles, all the hardship, all the pain, all the stuff that you've gone through. On this side, we're going to put what God is doing and can do and will do in your circumstances. And here's, here's how the weight goes. It goes like this. But this has an eternal dimension. And here's what he said. You put those on a scale and here's how it goes. Boom. He said, you want to play the comparison game of what you're going through now versus the eternal impact of the results of what you're going through? He says, this is light. This is incredibly heavy. For our light affliction, which but and momentary trouble. I, I, I memorized it in King James, so I might read it a little different. Are achieving for us an eternal glory that far away outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on that which is seen, our present circumstances, but on that which is unseen. Since what we see is temporary, but what is unseen, that's eternal. We all saw, and we are all processing, and we are all dealing with that which we see. We lost a friend this week. We lost somebody who last Sunday was sitting right out there, who many of you like me talked to and said, see you next week who I sat down after the service and sat in front of him, and we talked while the line for potluck got lower. Then he went in there and sat down there with other people, and we all made plans. He had plans all week, just like you do. He had things he was going to accomplish, just like you And we come here seven days later, and he's been gone for six of them. That's what we see. Hope focuses on a future in a confidence. And it doesn't change my present circumstances, but it does change what I focus on in my present circumstances. So I can either focus on that, or I can focus on that which is to come. So as I'm putting together pictures for the funeral, and I look at so many pictures where we were working up here, and I see Lynn and Dan. And I'm thinking, what a week this has been for those two. <laughs> Hope in a future, in a confidence that helps me not change my present circumstances, but rather how I see my present circumstances. That is biblical. So I end this morning with this idea. Biblical hope is centered on certainty, not possibility. It does not change the reality of your present world. But biblical hope changes the focus of your present world to the certainty of the future world. Hope patiently waits for the day that what you believe by faith 
you will one day experience in real time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that in the worst circumstances possible, where man had ruined everything you had tried to accomplish, you gave hope. For a future event that we now come and celebrate as something that has already happened, Lord. And so we thank you, first of all, for the Christmas story and for the Easter story. For the fact that you loved us enough to come. Lord, there's a lot of folks in here who are, who are struggling because they don't see any hope. They just simply are looking at the present circumstances. Lord, would you encourage their hearts to help them to see there's something far bigger at work here. And Lord, for all of us, may we honor and glorify you with our lives. And Lord, if this is our last day, may we make it count. And uh, we'll give you the honor and glory and the praise since we ask.